when I was a kid, there wouldn't be a sport that I wouldn't want to try and play. I wanted to always be outside and playing sports. Now that I look back at it, and I know now, uh, it, it allows me to escape. Uh, I think I realized I wanted to be a dad uh, when my playing career was over and I was a teacher. And you know, my love for my students and my love for my athletes, I think that's when it, that's when it clicked. It's like, well, yeah, I, I think I could be a really good dad. You're gonna do it now? All right, don't forget about the molars. When you become a dad, you realize that you know, your life isn't the most important thing anymore. And you're hoping that when you do become a dad and that you've done everything that you really wanted to do in your life. And now your experiences are not just for yourself, but your experiences are now with, you know, with your loved ones. And that becomes the most important thing. Let's go, let's go. Woo! Those are the things that a dad, you know, a really good dad does, which is sacrificing the rest of their lives so that their child's lives are better than theirs. I think that's the ultimate goal that you want your child to be better than you are. So I wanted to do something where my life was going to mean something long after I was gone. And that's what the Field of Dreams is for. All right, we need our bread. And we need our peanut butter. Ah, put them on your plate. He loved to climb. Cheating. He loved to do anything that he knew would, would make me have to hold my breath and scream and say, don't do that, you're gonna hurt yourself. He started uh, walking at 10 months old, started running a few weeks later, and then that was it. I mean, that's just the way he was. He was that typical Norman Rockwell kid that would have a frog hang out of one pocket, a dead bird in the other. Like, that was who he was. He, um, he was so much like me. This kid that wanted to play anything and dive into anything, to run into the ocean and to climb a rock wall and you know, try to hit a home run. I thought, along with my older son Owen, that it was gonna be the three of us, you know, going to games together. And then when they got older, you know, the three of us out on the basketball court and playing, you know, playing a round of golf and you know, having a beer afterwards, and that's that's what I envisioned. It was almost, it was great. I took a picture that morning. I don't know why I took the picture, but it was Brielle, Haley, and Gavin were sitting at the table eating cereal. It's the last picture I have of Gavin actually sitting in a chair by himself. He's actually up on his knees and he's eating. It's, it's a, a turn that's legal. Um, it's a turn that everyone makes and no one ever thinks twice about. Until you know, July 12th of 2012, we were just sitting here waiting here to make the left-hand turn that I've done endless times for seven, eight years I had made this same turn and uh, never thought twice of what was going to happen. Gavin was a mama's boy, as he still is, and I remember backing out and he was in the driveway screaming, running after the car, mom, mom. So that was hard for me. Um, that's the last time I heard him call my name. Then I heard the sound, which is this fully loaded beer truck going out, out onto its route, crashing into us from behind. Once I did come to, after being pushed over and hit by the, by the beer truck, I, I do risk remember, though, the dead silence. How is a 19-month-old boy, after being hit by something, not screaming and crying? And that's when I knew we were in trouble. I remember grabbing him out of his car seat, unbuckling him, trying to grab him out, and then just screaming just for help, anyone to come for help. And within a minute or two, you know, an ambulance, a police car, and they just take, you know, they just took Gavin away from me and just saying, you know, what happened and, you know, why, what, you know, why, you know, why, why did this happen? And my phone rang and it was Christian and, and he said, you know, there's been an accident. And he said, uh, I'm okay, but Gavin isn't. And basically, um, the impact of the truck was so immense that my actual car seat broke in half and the back of my head hit Gavin square in the skull. 
I knew as a mom this was serious. He didn't tell me how serious it was, but I knew in my heart it was. And I was just crying and praying, please keep him alive until I get there. The doctor came and, and said to us, um, we can't help him here. He said um, he, he has brain damage. I remember that was the one thing that stuck out in my head, he has brain damage. They said he could leave us at any minute. It's just suffocating. It's beyond words of how suffocating that feeling is to know that your child, you know, who you just left that morning, everybody was so happy. We were, it was a gorgeous day. We were all going to the water park. And then when this happened to him, it just, it's something that you couldn't imagine. Next stop on the trolley ride is brush your teeth. <gasps> Who loves the trolley? Yeah, you love the trolley. The family dynamics, you know, is difficult because of the fact that Mary and I knew that where Gavin was and where he is now, he needs you 24 hours a day. And I was a very active dad and the accident just took all that away. And I, I do feel bad for the four olders because they, they lost that mom and that dad. Just like we lost that Gavin. We're getting ready to go to therapy. Therapy's an hour and a half away, so we have to make sure that we have everything needed. I was in over my head. I had no idea, and no one was really offering me a lot of information. I can't wait! We were on our own. We didn't have time to prepare. It wasn't something where Gavin was, you know, still in the womb and the doctor said, listen, th there's going to be an issue with your son. It was literally in the snap of a finger, you were thrown into the world of special needs. And every person with a special need, it's different from another. I'll help you. Come on. Okay, ready? We're going to stand up, push into your righty foot. Go. There you go. Push, go. push, push. Strong, 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 strong. There you go. There, there you go. go. Good job. I got a lot of reading material, which I'll be quite honest with you, was extremely depressing. I mean, it was telling me everything he couldn't do. Can you keep it there? Good trying. That's nice, right. Nice, Flo five. Nice work. No. Like, your child will never do this. Like, there was no hope in this, this book at all. So I decided pretty early on that I was going to try to figure this out on my own. Look at this kid, look at this kid, look at this kid, this kid, not that kid, this kid right here. You know, over this last five years, it's just a, it's a, it's, it's a process and, uh, you know, now we have a, a good idea of who Gavin is, what are his abilities and, you know, I think we have, a, you know, a really good game plan, you know, over this last four or five years of what we need to do to get Gavin um, to be, you know, uh, to be better. Gavin began to improve to a point where he wanted to be with other kids. He wanted to participate. So you started to go to, you know, you know, local parks. And when you went to the local parks, you realized like, all right, well, how, how are you gonna get him down a slide? Or how are you gonna get him on a swing? All right, you ready? Come on, let's go to that slide. I can't wait to go super fast Come with on, you. Come let's go, let's go. Come get down on. that slide. There aren't many things that are available. If there is an adaptive swing, it's usually put far away from the other typical children that are playing. So now he feels isolation. Oh my goodness. Whoa. Whoa. My name's Gavin Schneider. I went to therapy since I was like two. I still go to therapy one time a week right now. People that don't really know about special needs, they they kind of like stare at you a little bit. And like, it doesn't bother me anymore. Like, I don't care, I try to ignore it. But like, it's still there. I, th I think ignorance is probably more it. And in their defense, probably 10 years ago, I would have been the same way before Kaden was born, because you don't know. Ooh, swimming. <laughs> That would be a fun idea. When we engage with um, typical families and typical children, you either have, um, you know, the type of children that 
they're afraid of Fina. Um, you know, I tell them, Serafina has a different brain and um, it makes her very different than, than you and I, but we still have the same heart. I like to play baseball and I like to play football with my brother when I'm like outside and stuff. I had to learn how to do it differently because like I'm not that fast and stuff. So like I always used to be the quarterback because I'm good at throwing but not good at running, kind of like how Tom Brady is not that good at running or Ben Roethlisberger is not that good at running or, you know, kind of like that. They are just the same. They might not look the same. They might not be able to move the same or respond the same, but they're the same. They're humans and every single human being on this earth deserves the quality of life and of fun and of enjoyment that everyone else deserves. The Field of Dreams project is a project that Mr. Kane started for his son and other special needs kids like me. It, it's like going to be like a big complex that has baseball fields, playgrounds, trampolines. It started out just a, a baseball field and a playground. And it was going to be a simple project. And then we started talking to people about it, and you know, we'd hear, well, I don't want to play baseball, I want to play golf. So, okay, well, maybe we should have a miniature golf course. I don't want to play golf or baseball, I want to play basketball. This has to be something for anyone of any special need, and that's when it really took off into now this little project into this $2.2 .2 million special needs complex. I, I believe it's attainable, I truly do, because the way the community has come and backed us, with this idea, I definitely think it's attainable. I'm Connor and I'm seven years old. Gavin and Connor met at preschool and there was an article in the paper and reading it, I recognized that it was Gavin, my friend Gavin. And so it was just around the time of Connor's birthday and that's how the whole idea of him having a party to celebrate his friendship with Gavin and to do something for someone else. I actually wanted to donate money to fill the dream so they can build it and because it's a field where other people can make dreams come true. Connor has said it makes him a better person. Like he realizes it makes him a good friend. Gavin has one inside problem, his brain. But his heart is the same. Connor knew nothing about special needs. But he met Gavin and he saw like, wow, he's just like me. That's what I want people to know. He can feel, and he can hear you, and he understands everything you're saying. Yes, he might not be able to walk or talk, but he's exactly that same kid inside that he was before the accident. Feel the dreams is for anybody. You're coming into a place where you know that you're not the one being stared at because everyone is in the same boat. More so, it's also for the caretakers, you know, the moms, the dads, the aunts, the uncles, to be able to now bring their special needs person and be able to sit on a bench, watch their loved one do something that either they used to do or thought they never could do. There's so many children, adults, um, adolescents, just people in need of something like this. What they are doing for this community, this area, is amazing. I really think that we have the potential of being the town of the future for inclusion and disabilities. It's not just about disabilities, it's about including everybody. It should be a part of everyone's world and Gavin part of our world. We think that's super special. Like we feel um, very blessed that he's part of our world. Everyone has a kid inside of them and everyone remembers playing and doing something that made them happy. You just have to remind them. That's the key thing. I need this project to be built for my son, no lie. That's the selfish reason of it. I want my son to be able to play sports and to be able to have a place to go to no matter what the case might be. But then it's grown from there because there are so many other people that need this help. And that's the goal of the Field of Dreams. <laughs>